What up, HyperChange? Welcome to a new episode. Today we're mixing it up a little bit and I'm going to do an audiobook recording of HyperChange, A Scheme of Consciousness. So for those of you guys who are new to the channel, this is a book I wrote about four to five months ago explaining my investing philosophy, you know, why, how I value companies, my views on entrepreneurship, why I started HyperChange, and sort of a little bit about my background so some of my subscribers could learn about it. And the channel has grown a ton since then. Um, a bunch of you probably don't even know that I wrote a book and I've had a ton of requests to do an audiobook sort of video version. So this episode is basically just going to be me reading through HyperChange, A Scheme of Consciousness. Also, I'm going to put out the audio version of this recording as a podcast to relaunch our podcast because I know you guys have been waiting for that as well. So I'll put the link in the description for the podcast version of this. Just a little bit of a heads up. Um, this is called A Scheme of Consciousness, which is something that I made up. So even though it looks like a book, um, this was not edited. I didn't have it reviewed by anybody. The idea is sort of to have it more be like a poem or sort of freestyle um, and there's going to be curse words in it. So just a heads up, fair warning, if you're under 18, maybe you shouldn't watch this. Let's get right into it. So hyperchange, a scheme of consciousness. Preface, scheme of consciousness. When people write books, there are usually so many steps. Edit this, check that, get a publisher, promo whatever, etc. Fuck it. Why not try something new? I'm writing a book in less than a month. From start to finish, no one will read it until I self-publish it. No editor, no proofreader, no outside opinions, no influence, no hype, just me and hyperchange. Why do this? I want to show you how I think about the world with no filter. All of the processes in old school publishing are just censors of authors' work and ideas. This is pure. This is real. Flaws exposed. It's all a part of the art. Writing this book is like painting for me. Just letting the ideas flow to capture my passion at a single moment in time. This means a cheaper book, faster publishing time, and the ability for me to move on to my next project. If you're not okay with grammatical errors or this philosophy, read something else. There are millions of books done the boring way already. I call this new form of writing a scheme of consciousness. It's a freestyle, in book form. It's art. This is a new era. I want to start a new genre. It could totally flop and ruin my reputation, or it could inspire my peers to think about writing in a new way and catalyze hundreds of books in this style, or likely something in between. The world needs more out of the box, break the rules shit. Things are changing faster than ever. Raw authenticity wins in this new digital era. This is a bet on that. I hope this book leaves you with more questions than answers. To the HyperChange subscribers, this book is for you. Also, I owe the biggest thank you. Huge shout out to my parents, Lil Sis, extended family, homies, mentors, teachers, and everybody else who has helped me scheme on all my crazy ideas throughout the years. This book would have never happened without you. Also, big thanks to Leo, Alex, Jay Filchi, and Ree for reading this through at a moment's notice and giving me crucial last minute ideas. My investing journey. I'm 24 as I type this. I'm half Italian, mom, and half New Englander, dad. I grew up in Seattle and my parents are nerdy scientists. Moved to New York in 2011 to attend NYU and study finance. But that's the boring stuff. My investing journey began in early 2008 when I was 15, almost 10 years ago. I've easily put in 10,000 hours learning about markets but still feel like a total noob. The first stock I bought was Sony. In 2008, nobody had HDTVs yet, but it was clear they were the future. The quality was a major step up and they kept getting more affordable. I thought everybody was going to buy a new TV and upgrade to watch the Super Bowl, of course, or that's why me and my dad wanted to. Then the recession happened and Sony crashed. But even if it didn't, TVs are a pretty commoditized business, so I doubt it would have been a great investment anyway. Regardless, that got me hooked. The light bulb went off. Stocks aren't just numbers on a computer screen. They are pieces of ownership in the businesses we interact with every day. Around the same time, Uncle Raleigh bought me the snowball, Warren Buffett's biography. By my sophomore year in high school, I was waking up at 6.15 every day to check the market and start trading. Whether it was flipping penny stocks, buying options on the silver bubble, or searching for the next Apple, ended up being Tesla, every day was like Christmas. There was always another financial theory to unwrap. The more I learned about the stock market, finance, and economics, the more passionate I became. I quickly began to realize the importance of money in our capitalist society. This is how the world works. This is how things change. This is how you can make a difference. But believe it or not, I wasn't hooked on getting rich. I wanted the derivative, power and influence. Not on some greedy shit, on some Robin Hood shit. Heist the fucking game, make billions, and give it back to the people. There are so many problems the world needs to address. Fixing these with the brute force of unlimited, unrestrained capital seemed like the most efficient method of personally instilling societal progress and making an impact. 
To this day, I don't think politicians are the leaders of the free world. In fact, I believe their power continues to wane by the day. For better or worse, private sector wealth wields enormous and growing influence. Lobbying is institutionalized bribery. It's not a perfect system, but money, for the most part, allows individuals and corporations to either ignore the law or change it. In a utopia, government would iron out these issues and become a fairer, more democratized platform. But I wasn't going to wait for that to happen. It wasn't long before I figured out that hedge fund managers were the highest paid people in the world, with the top performers making billions of dollars in a single year. I thought, I'm going to do that too. Get really rich investing while simultaneously learning how to identify, run, and engage with successful businesses. A hybrid of wealth creation and education. Long story short, I kept investing and started blogging about stocks on Seeking Alpha in my senior year of high school. With that on my resume, during my freshman year at NYU, I got connected with a startup that helped students set up the infrastructure needed to manage small amounts of money. I raised 20000 from the founder of the startup, my homie, and my mom. This was the closest thing to an investment fund that a 19-year-old me could pull off. In a 25-month period, July 2012 to August 14, my investors made an 81% return compared to 46 for the S&P 500, assuming dividends reinvested. The majority of these gains came from, you guessed it, Tesla. We bought in at 29. This, combined with continued blogging on Seeking Alpha, gave me the confidence and resume to step my shit up. One day, I got an email from an investor named Sam, name changed who liked my writing and wanted to help doing stock research. One thing led to another, and about a year later, Sam decided to give me 500000 of his capital to invest in a portfolio of small companies. I was 21. Sam is the best investor I know. Most of what I learned about interviewing management teams, thinking long-term, and understanding business models came from him. But that's not what I admire most about him. He's so humble, genuine, friendly, and positive. I almost think it's a shame more people don't know who he is. The world needs more people like Sam to get loud with their ideas. Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. Getting $500,000 to manage was a dream come true. I had a mentor who was helping me and wanted me to grow. I was learning more than ever. Having his connections and capital allowed me to have 100 plus one-on-one -on -one meetings with different CEOs of companies across all sectors. By my senior year at NYU, I was routinely missing class to go to investment conferences, analyst days, and tune into earnings calls. At the time, school was boring and a joke. I felt like I was killing it in the real world and didn't need to listen to professors who weren't. This was the naive, cocky asshole in me, and I'm glad I started fucking up because of my egotistical attitude. After I graduated in May 2015, I started managing the portfolio for Sam full-time. After a year, I felt like I was at a dead end. Working alone got lonely. I realized that I didn't want to sit behind a computer all day, keeping my best ideas to, to myself just to profit from them. There was an emptiness to it. On top of all that, my performance was lagging the Russell 2000, and overall inspiration was waning. It wasn't as easy to keep crushing the market as I thought it would be. Go figure. It was time for a change. I needed to shake shit up. While I was munching on a salad at Sweetgreen, arguing about food stocks with an investing buddy, we started talking to two startup employees sitting next to us. They were in the food business, and within two weeks, I had my first 9 to 5. It was cool, I learned a lot working on a team, but also realized that management and I didn't share any of the same values. In late 2016, after four months on the job, I started pulling a Gary V. Would do the nine to five, then go straight home and start working on content for HyperChange. It was a grind. By February 2017, shit was hitting the fan at work. A five million funding round was botched and only 500K was raised. With the company losing money and not much in the bank, about half the employees were laid off, including me. I had a little bit of money saved up and decided to bet on myself and go all in. My work in finance wasn't done. Hyperchange TV. Pouring your passion into something and making it public is really scary. You're opening yourself up to criticism, scrutiny, and judgment. I've never worked at a bank or any kind of financial firm. I'm a Ronin, self-taught on the internet and by a handful of key mentors. The smartest financial minds my age are not creating content. They are working for banks, hedge funds, venture capital firms, and tech companies. In the financial world, making your views publicly available for critique and analysis is so taboo. What if you're wrong? You'll never get hired again. Everybody's decisions about their public statements are guided by fear. Nobody's on the offense. With the brightest people silent, the opportunity to openly publish my research is too good to ignore. Have you ever watched CNBC? The analysis is stale, boring, filled with fallacies, and frankly toxic for anyone trying to educate themselves about financial markets. 
Why do you think the average viewer is 50 plus? Millennials and Gen Z aren't buying it. Pundits, experts, newsletters, and talking heads from the old school financial media will tell you they have all the answers. They can simultaneously predict what every stock will do tomorrow while nonchalantly understanding the nuance of every macroeconomic trend. Sorry, I'm calling bullshit. This know-it-all mentality is the exact reason why they are failing. Nobody fully understands the financial markets. The prevailing theories governing asset prices are all fluid and likely to be disrupted in perpetuity. The second you think you know it all is the second you've lost. Hyperchange is founded on this principle. I want every episode to leave you with more questions than answers. Getting you to think more. Appreciating the complexity of the issues we discuss. Unfortunately, the lack of quality financial analysis, combined with no education about taxes, stocks, or personal finance in school, has left my peers stranded. The level of financial illiteracy is astonishing, and I didn't see it improving. I'd bet 98% of Americans can't articulate the correlation between share price and market capitalization. This is a real problem. How do we expect the populace to make informed decisions about laws and governance without understanding the economic implications of their decisions? The bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. Hyperchange TV is the financial show I think is missing. It's not the silver bullet by any means, but I think it makes learning accessible. I want to show people it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to have new ideas. It's okay not to know it all. Maybe it's crazy, but I think that's exactly what Wall Street needs. A kid in his bedroom reading SEC filings till 4 a.m. making crazy predictions about the future of technology and finance. By documenting my journey of learning about the stock market, I want to help others along theirs. Every other industry has had its we just got fucked by the kid in the hoodie moment. Wall Street is next. So I started making YouTube videos, just talking about my ideas on investing and mostly Tesla. It was fun, and to my surprise, people were actually watching. So I kept pushing. One day, my buddy Omid came up with a new series called Moonshot Monday. Pitch a moonshot buyout, partnership, or just any crazy tech business idea in a five to 10 minute episode. These pitches would not only include the business rationale and financial analysis, but offer clear evidence it was a fiscally feasible and accretive to both parties. In March, 2017, me and Kevin, my homie and Hyperchanger's creative director, made Amazon should buy Whole Foods. This was Moonshot Monday number four. On June 16th, I woke up to texts from people I hadn't talked to in months. My Twitter was blowing up. Jay Filchie was calling me nonstop. It fucking happened. Amazon announced they were buying Whole Foods. Wall Street was shocked. The business world was rocked. Hyperchange and Scott Galloway were among a handful of people who were lucky enough to see this coming. The stocks of Walmart, Costco, Target, Kroger, and SuperValue fell between 4 to 12% the same day. Somebody posted our video on Reddit slash videos, and somehow it took off and remained in the top three for a day or two and got nearly 100,000 views. This boosted the channel's subscribers from 800 to 3,000, but it wasn't about the growth. It was more than that. We were right. We saw a $14 billion acquisition coming that will go down as the most transformative move in Amazon's history. We did it with no help, no paid research, no MBAs, just two homies, a laptop, a camera, and a vision for the future. It's a real world example of hyperchange. This would have never been possible before. The little guy was one step ahead of Wall Street. Amazon plus Whole Foods gave me the confidence to double down, sell half my Tesla stock, cash out a Bitcoin and bootstrap hyperchange. I've been working my ass off ever since. As I typed this, I sold the remainder of Bitcoin, more on this later, and I bought myself six months of burn for hyperchange. It feels like the universe has given me a second chance. When I originally started going full-time on hyperchange, Bitcoin was under a thousand. For the past 12 months, I've been strategically liquidating and sold most of my Bitcoin over 13,000, 20x plus from my original investment. Without this cash infusion, I would have had to get a side hustle. 7-Eleven clerk, barista, waiter, dishwasher, babysitting job, months ago. The two things, Tesla and Bitcoin, my professors, mentors, homies, the experts, and pretty much the whole damn world thought were a joke and mistake to invest in, were ironically the best investments I've ever made. Between both, I've made thousands of dollars, enabling me to fund my own startup out of pocket. Fuck you, Wall Street. Now I'm going all in on improving the quality of my videos, making more creative content, and pushing the envelope further, and, and building hyperchange into what I think it has the potential to be. The intersection of finance, economics, entrepreneurship, and sustainability is something millions of people care about, or should. I think it's partially my job to make sure this happens. There is also a selfish motive behind hyperchange. I want to learn. 
I want to have people that are a lot smarter than me tell me I'm wrong and explain why. Open sourcing my ideas has allowed this to happen. I owe so much to the people who watch my videos and give their input and advice. The connections I have made in the hyperchange community will last a lifetime and are allowing me to learn more, faster than I ever thought possible. Thank you, hyperchangers. Beyond educating and explaining my ideas slash theories about finance and investing, hyperchange has a broader mission, inspiring. By watching me build hyperchange from the ground up, I want to show my subscribers that they can do it too. Bet on their passion. Work hard and do it by themselves. No industry approval needed. There's never been a better time to be the scrappy underdog taking down the establishment, and I want to prove it. Hyperchange. Intro. The bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. WTF is hyperchange. Literally, a word I made up. Figuratively, I would describe it as the current economic era we are living in. Life is getting weird. We talk to speakers with blue lights, Alexa, take selfies with Pikachu filters, Snapchat, tell kids to get into cars with strangers, Uber, and have strangers sleep in our houses, Airbnb. And don't even get me started on where dating apps are going. Artificial intelligence algorithms determining who we mate with. Things that were inconceivable years ago are now social norms. The next 50 years of humanity, and maybe even more, will be defined by this perpetually accelerating disruption. We are living in a hyperchange. The backbone of this phenomena is rapid advances in technology. Moore's law is enabling a data explosion. Software is eating the world. The internet is allowing frictionless communication and content distribution. We all have supercomputers in our pockets. We are living in a sci-fi movie and it's only going to get crazier faster. Among this disruption lies incredible opportunity across every industry in every geography. Is this a good thing? Yes. Sure, technology could kill us, robots, AI, looking at our phones, etc. But it's also the only chance we've got at survival. We need to fix a lot of shit fast. There are almost 8 billion people on the planet today. By 2050, there will be almost 10 billion. When imagining a future historian's take on the 21st century, I struggle to comprehend how we will be remembered. Will this era be looked upon as an independent creative renaissance where technological advancement, immense wealth creation, and social progress pioneer us into an exciting multiplanetary future? Or will this be the era looked upon as a parabolic increase of materialistic gluttony, pollution, ramping ignorance, and a failure to govern with an eye towards our future that ultimately results in our own self-inflicted demise. As of now, we are teetering on the precipice of both outcomes. The point is, we are at a critical juncture in human history. I'm equally scared shitless and excited as fuck. You should be too. Why are we ignoring negative externalities? The biggest flaw in our current version of democratic capitalism and society in general is we do not tax negative externalities. When you fill up your car with oil, you're not paying for the pollution you admit. When you get a latte at Starbucks, you don't pay for throwing away your cup. Science is quickly proving nearly every industry and institution that built the US and world economy up until now is unsustainable. What do I mean by unsustainable? If we keep up our current trajectory of consumption, the planet's ability to foster a biome that humans can live in will be a thing of the past. If it's 100 years, 200, or 1,000, I'm not sure, but I don't think it's worth finding out. Whether it's oil, natural gas, the internal combustion engine, coal, factory farming, monoculture crops, pesticide and fertilizer use, healthcare, social security, the military industrial complex, fast fashion, beauty, excessive consumption, waste, or forced child labor, you name it. If an industry is making a lot of money today, it's probably fucking up the planet. To give you some idea what I'm talking about, we are on track to have more plastic in the ocean by fish, by weight, by 2050. 50% of the world's species will be facing extinction by the end of this century. Carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere is above 400 parts per million, the highest it's been in 800,000 years. 2017 was the U.S.'s third hottest year on record, based on 123 years of data. The other two were 2012 and 2016. Rainforests cover 6% of our planet's landmass and produce 40% of the Earth's oxygen. They will completely vanish in 100 years at the current rate of deforestation. Worldwide sea levels have risen 8 inches in the past 100 years, and the pace of this rise is accelerating. The average American produces 4.4 pounds of trash every single day. That's all scary, and what's even scarier is those stats are only scratching the surface. I could have listed 100 more, but you get the point. Start Googling. I am not a scientist by any means, so take my analysis with a big grain of salt. 
but I am a citizen of Earth who thinks we need to be exponentially more thoughtful about the impact of our everyday decisions and the negative externalities that come with them. Nobody's perfect, and I myself am guilty of perpetuating all of these atro atrocities. But understanding this is the important first step towards finding solutions. What's so frustrating about policymakers' lack of focus on this is that taxing negative externalities is objectively rational in the long term. It's like an ultra-high interest credit card loan we are taking out on nature. Sure, we don't pay for shit up front, but it will fuck us later. This is the biggest thing that governments need to fix in our lifetime. Otherwise, the burden will be on individuals to price in negative externalities themselves. For some reason, I doubt this will be as effective. What if we taxed oil companies based on incremental GHG emissions and used the revenue to subsidize electric transport and renewable energy? What if we taxed plastic and used the money to fund education about the environment and clean up our oceans? Trash. Go anywhere on the planet and look at all the garbage. Plastic bags, soda cans, wrappers, cigarette butts, beer bottles, etc. It's all man-made, recent, and nobody cares. How is this not an abomination? Our respect for the natural world has fallen drastically in the past few centuries. We're out of touch. We focused on growth and economic expansion at all costs, leaving our planet by the wayside. Reversing this trajectory of consumption and waste will not be easy, but it is going to be necessary if we want to avoid idiocracy. The bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. It's difficult to understate the urgency at which our capitalistic infrastructure needs to be utterly transformed from the inside out for our species to survive beyond the next few centuries. We need to transition off fossil fuels and dramatically reduce the untethered consumption patterns that have been increasingly ingrained in our society. But those are just the first steps. Sorry the beginning of this book has been so dark. I promise it's getting brighter. At the end of the day, I'm incredibly hopeful. We all have the chance to play instrumental roles in permanently altering the habits of society and pivot humanity towards a sustainable future. Companies that solve these challenges are waiting to be built. Entrepreneurs who create products and services that disrupt the status quo are waiting to be born. We desperately need hyperchange, and you have the chance to be a part of it. If that doesn't motivate you, I don't know what will. Hyperchange. Industries, trends, and the future. Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the blockchain. Gold is a shiny rock, money is green paper, and Bitcoin is a chunk of code. Software is eating the world, blockchain is eating software. Alexander Sankoff. Part of the reason I wanted to write this book so quickly and get it out is because things are changing so fast. Bitcoin and crypto assets are a perfect example of this. What's the dollar? The prevailing bear thesis I hear on Bitcoin is that it's worthless. No inherent value. Well, what's the inherent value of the US dollar? We got off the gold standard in 1971. Hint, it's just green paper. Bitcoin may go to shit, but at least you should know what's backing it up is the same thing propping up the US dollar. Trust. The only reason you're okay with dollars and not Bitcoin is because everybody accepts dollars. You trust that they will retain their value and be accepted as a medium of exchange. The, dollar, the US dollar might be the world's biggest cult. I don't see any reason why trust in a crypto asset can't rival a central bank's in my lifetime. If one thing in history is constant, it's that mediums of exchange and stores of value are constantly being disrupted. So why is assuming that the status quo, the US dollar, will last in perpetuity so normal? It's a bubble, right? It's easy to label anything that's rapidly rising in value as a bubble and capture the near-term praise of being viewed as a shrewd skeptic. This attitude is very in vogue in the financial media. We could be witnessing a bubble or we could be witnessing one of the most disruptive technologies in modern finance go mainstream. You tell me. The recent news of random microcaps, Long Island Ice Tea, Eastman Kodak, Riot Blockchain, etc., including the word blockchain in their business model and going up 5 to 10x overnight, is only one side of the story. Sure, it's the sign of a frothy market and irrational exuberance, but we saw the same thing happen with the internet bubble of the early 2000s. Yes, there was a period where tech stocks were overvalued and investing in them was a letdown. But the overarching vision of the internet changing the world forever could not have been more accurate. In most cases, bubbles are a natural cyclical prerequisite for hyper-disruptive technologies. I think we are seeing a similar phenomena with crypto assets and the blockchain. The disruptive potential is real and will change the world, but near-term asset prices are probably vastly in inflated by greedy speculators. Blockchain, the tech behind crypto assets. Bitcoin and Ethereum may not last, but the, the, but the technology behind them will. It's called blockchain. I've only met a couple people who seem to fully understand it. 
I'm still just getting my feet wet learning about it, but from what I can tell, the potential is staggering, monumental, trillions. At its most basic level, the blockchain is a spreadsheet, a list of transactions. What makes it so special is everybody confirms the same transactions and they are transparently available for everybody to see. This has the ability to commoditize trust and decentralize many of the functions offered by central banks, Wall Street, and the world's largest corporations. It's worth learning about. How do you value crypto assets? The short answer is, nobody knows. And that's the fun part. I like things I don't understand. It pushes me to learn, get uncomfortable, and compound my investing knowledge. That's why I originally bought Bitcoin. The idea was so fascinating and out of this world and too complex for me to grasp. I didn't bet my life savings on it, but I put enough to move the needle if it ever 20 baggered. It did. Sure, there is no P-E ratio, earnings, or book value for the financial nerds to value these crypto assets, but they aren't stocks. This is an entirely new asset class that is not going away. Just because you don't understand something's value doesn't mean it doesn't have any. Valuing crypto assets is still an infantile school of thought. Chris Berniski is probably the leader. He's worth a follow. My basic investment slash valuation rationale on Bitcoin is pretty simple. It's digital gold. A global decentralized store of value that isn't controlled by a single entity and has a finite supply. Basically a hedge against inflation and G-check on the central bank fiat system. Here's a back of the napkin calculation to show you how I think about valuing crypto assets. The value of all the gold in the world is $7.5 trillion. There are only 21 million Bitcoin that will ever be created. So if Bitcoin fulfills this vision of digital gold, its network value would be in the same ballpark, putting its price per coin at 357,000, or equivalent to 7.5 trillion divided by 21 million. Story time. In business school, Bitcoin was a joke. That's part of the reason I thought business school was a joke, especially to all my professors, except one. He was an awesome VC that taught an entrepreneurship class. He had a conspiracy theory that the government created Bitcoin in 2008 at the peak of the Great Recession in case shit really hit the fan. It was a backup if the dollar collapsed. True or not, this crazy theory got me hooked on Bitcoin and eventually the blockchain. It was 2013 and Bitcoin was at 30 bucks. Satoshi Nakamoto. It's estimated that Bitcoin's founder Satoshi Nakamoto owns 980,000 coins. No one knows who he is, but he is going to be the richest guy on the planet if Bitcoin crosses 100,000, depending on how fast Amazon stock keeps rising. What dystopia are we living in? We're one more Bitcoin bull run away from an anonymous cryptocurrency founder being the richest man on earth. And Donald Trump is president. You tell me we aren't living in a Black Mirror episode. If crypto assets continue to be a valid asset class, an entirely new generation of wealth will be created. It's Revenge of the Nerds 2.0 and Satoshi will be king. Pollution. One of the dirty secrets of crypto assets is the amount of energy required to run their respective networks. The backbone of every crypto asset is a decentralized network of server farms all around the world performing the cryptography tasks required to validate the blockchain. At its current stage, this process across almost every crypto asset is excruciatingly energy intensive. If the rate of energy consumption by these networks does not decline radically in the near future, the entire disruptive premise of the blockchain will fall by the wayside. The good news is smart people are working around the clock to solve this technological challenge. I'm hopeful. Why I sold Bitcoin, digital gold, and bought Ethereum, digital oil. Speaking of smart people working around the clock, I think Ethereum is the most fascinating crypto asset. I recently sold all the rest of my Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, and now Ethereum is my only material crypto asset position. To be clear, most of my Bitcoin gains are going to fund hyperchange, but still, I put some in Ethereum. Here's why. Bitcoin is breaking. The network hasn't been able to scale beyond processing more than 350,000 transactions per day since late 2016. The average fee per transaction hasn't dropped below $20 since mid-December 2017. And the Bitcoin cash fork freaked me out. The developer mindshare of the Bitcoin community is divided. There's bad blood, and I think that's a major impediment to progress. Beyond that, the bull case of Ethereum results in a far larger potential network value than that of Bitcoin. As I type this, the network value of Bitcoin is $234 billion, and the network value of Ethereum is $120 billion. If Bitcoin's 7.5 trillion digital gold endgame is sexy, the Ethereum endgame of digital oil is even sexier. It's not just a decentralized store of value, see stablecoins being built on the Ethereum blockchain, it's how we execute smart contracts in the digital economy. Put simply, it's how shit actually gets done. 
In a bull case, this is the backbone of Web 3.0. It's a platform for decentralized applications known as dApps to run on. You're not betting on Ethereum, you're betting on what can be built on top of it. It's like the iOS app store, but with a much grander decentralized vision. Sure, a lot of other crypto assets could claim to compete with Ethereum and build a similar smart contracts platform, but I think it's clear who's winning, at least for now. Ethereum was founded and is currently led by Vitalik Buterin, one of today's most intriguing intelligent fanatics. He's 23, a Thiel Fellowship Award winner and quickly becoming worship philosopher in the crypto asset community. Having a known leader that can resolve issues, guide strategy, and lead the Ethereum developer community like a nimble startup is a major advantage over Bitcoin, whose founder remains anonymous and silent. That's all great, but what really matters is Vitalik and the Ethereum Foundation are executing. The Ethereum blockchain was processing 45,000 transactions per day entering 2017, and now that number is consistently over 1 million, and continues to scale rapidly. That means the network is already capable of processing 3 x of what bitcoin can in the past 12 months ethereum has leapfrogged bitcoin in capacity and the gap continues to widen but even ethereum isn't quite ready for prime time yet to put things in context visa's network processes about 150 million transactions per day ethereum at 1 million plus is still a drop in the bucket but it's not about where we're at today it's about where we're headed vitalik and his team continue to work on some of the world's most advanced cryptography in order to tackle this scaling challenge as the network continues to grow rapidly, the progress is transparently evident. Going from 45,000 to a million in 2017 was a 22x year-over-year -year increase. If Ethereum continues at this rate, it will be at 22 million a day by the end of 2018 and 484 million per day by the end of 2019. This is just a back of the napkin extrapolation, but you get the point. In two to three years, this thing could dwarf Visa and be tackling much bigger challenges. This is the multi-trillion dollar bull case for Ethereum. Risks. If you're not prepared to lose all of your money, you shouldn't invest in crypto assets. If Bitcoin starts crashing, it will get ugly. A pullback of 80% or more would not surprise me. It's happened before. In 2013, Bitcoin fell from over 1,000 to below 200 in just eight months. In these scenarios, exchanges like Coinbase will freeze and lock your assets, creating even more panic and accentuating the downward spiral. It'll be a crypto bank run. Bitcoin won't be the only thing that gets hit. My guess is all of the crypto assets will fall in lockstep if a crash starts happening. It's important to be excited about crypto assets, but it's equally as important to accept that they could be worthless at any moment in time. Without this mindset, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. The internet at scale. It's hard to fathom how much opportunity the internet creates. The internet has taken the shackles off the distribution of content and ideas. It's commoditizing knowledge faster than ever before. In the grand scheme of history, we are still in the infancy of witnessing the profound impact global connectivity will have on our civilization. We're 20 years into the modern internet, maybe less. The internet is exposing the truth in an unprecedented fashion. This is exactly what we need to accelerate hyperchange and help us uncover the negative externalities that, corpor that corporations are incentivized to keep quiet. Creators and the decentralization of brand equity. Individuals now have more power than brands. The top five most followed Twitter accounts are people, not brands or companies. Same with the top five most followed Instagram accounts and YouTube channels. Creators are a new tour de force in media that we've never seen before. They are platform agnostic and boast followings that old school networks could not begin to comprehend. Social networks like YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook are enabling individuals to create and distribute content, gain a following, monetize it globally for free. We are going through a massive power shift in the media industry. Cable companies and network conglomerates are in denial of the attention they are losing on a daily basis. The floodgates are open. Beyond the proliferation of smartphones, professional cameras are being commoditized at an astonishing rate. Video editing software continues to improve. Any advice from what camera to buy, how to learn editing software, to how to light a set can be found on YouTube in minutes. While this is happening, tech companies like Amazon, Netflix, Facebook, and Apple are rapidly scaling multi-billion dollar original content budgets. This is no coincidence. YouTube and other social networks are quickly becoming the training ground for these bigger VC-style entertainment dollars. Mark Zuckerberg has called this the golden era of video. He's right. We are witnessing an explosion of unfiltered creativity. There has never been a better time to be a content creator. Own your art and distribute it yourself. Nobody can stop you. The future of food. 
Our food system is a fucking mess. Agriculture is one of the biggest global emitters of greenhouse gases. It's the hidden juggernaut ushering in climate change. It's the reason we're cutting down the Amazon, causing thousands of species to go extinct, and more broadly destroying the natural beauty of Earth at an astonishing rate. I know that you think driving electric is important, so do I, and it is, but what you eat is worth arguably even more scrutiny. Livestock and animal product consumption is by far the biggest culprit of agriculture's pollutive nature. I don't think going vegan is the complete answer, or going vegetarian, I could be dead wrong, although these are important steps in the right direction. I think we just need to rebalance our diets. The masterminds behind standardizing dietary guidelines, food education, and policy are the world's largest food companies. This new industrialized system has dramatically reduced the accountability of the farmers and firms that grow our food. Nobody knows where their eggs came from or who raised the chickens anymore. Corporate incentives are aligned to sell more products, not create a more sustainable supply chain, let alone get you the healthiest and most nutritious food. They don't care about you, they care about profit. But there's a lot of hope. I'm a huge believer that we are in the early stages of witnessing a multi-decade transition from an industrialized era food system of making things cheaper and faster to a decentralized system of micro artisans. Avocado toast, craft beer, $6 lattes, quinoa, salads, call it what you want. Consumers aren't just getting gourmet, they are getting smarter. Where food comes from. If there's any hope for saving the food system, education will be the catalyst for progress. It's not that consumers want to ruin the environment, it's that they don't know they are doing it. The more I learn about where my food comes from, the more I care, and the more informed purchasing decisions I make. Clean meat. This is exactly the kind of technology that makes me so excited for the future. Impossible Foods is recreating the burger from the ground up with 100% plant-based vegan ingredients. But it's not your average veggie burger. It looks, tastes, and bleeds like meat. Founded by a Stanford professor, they have already raised $250 million from people like Bill Gates and are making millions of pounds of the Impossible Burger. The future is coming, and fast. Other startups like Memphis Meats are pioneering even more complex versions of burgers without the cows by trying to grow animal stem cells in test tubes. This technology also has the potential to get us the burgers we love with a fraction of the environmental impact. And burgers aren't the only thing getting disrupted. These startups and many more have ambitions to recreate all types of livestock products more sustainably while vastly improving animal welfare. Indoor farming, giga greenhouses. In 10 years, you'll tap a button on your Amazon app. A robot will immediately begin harvesting your lettuce on the 28th floor of a massive greenhouse. A drone will pick this up and fly it to you within 30 minutes. Greenhouse, giga greenhouses aren't some future far off technology. They are here, scaling rapidly, and being funded by hundreds of millions of dollars of the world's smartest capital. See aero farms, plenty, etc. I'm talking about multi-story, hydroponic, software-controlled, LED-lit skyscrapers that grow, fruit and, that grow fruits and vegetables. This new tech-centric farming method has several key advantages over old-school agriculture. It reduces food miles and supports local economies. We can build these near cities. It can be 10 to 100x more efficient per square foot. You can go vertical. It uses 90% less water. You can recycle. It's closed loop. No fertilizers are put into the environment. It can grow food year round and changing weather patterns from climate change can't hurt yields. Why is now the time for giga greenhouses? The biggest cost input is energy, heating, cooling, lighting fans, etc. If you're burning coal to run these greenhouses, it doesn't make much sense. If you're using solar panels and wind turbines, we're getting somewhere. As batteries and solar panels continue to get cheaper, thanks Elon, the economics and sustainability profile of giga greenhouses are getting more attractive by the day. Beyond the commercial giga greenhouses, hydroponic technologies can scale down to the micro. We're talking mini farms in houses, schools, and communities across America. Empowering people to grow their own food will do wonders for food security and awakening society to the nuances of the whole system. We are too far removed from the food that we eat, and it's only getting worse. Indoor, indoor farming can help reverse this trend. Moonshot Monday. Amazon buys Gotham Greens. Gotham Greens is an exciting example of hyperchange. They are reimagining the urban landscape by building hybrid, hydroponic greenhouses on unused rooftops. They have a partnership with Whole Foods and built a farm on top of a store. It's partially powered by solar panels that offer shade over the parking lot. I've been there. It's in Brooklyn, of course. In total, Gotham Greens runs four rooftop farms. According to their website, each location is getting significantly more efficient than the last. 
The original location in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, built in 2011, can grow 6.7 pounds of produce per square foot per year. The newest one in Chicago, built in 2015, can grow 100 pounds of produce per square foot per year. They grow different kinds of gourmet lettuces, basil, tomatoes, and even make pesto year-round. These products are sold directly below on the shelves of Whole Foods. There are zero food miles involved in this operation. On the shelf next to Gotham Green's products are Whole Foods 365 private label branded lettuces. They are the same price. If you check the back of the 365 lettuces label, it says they are distributed from a Whole Foods facility in Austin, Texas. That's 1,700 miles from Brooklyn. I don't think shipping trucks full of lettuce across the country that require constant refrigeration is a great long-term solution to our greens supply chain, even if they are using a renewably powered Tesla semi-truck. Beyond transportation costs and emissions, this system means food that's far less fresh and therefore less nutritious and lower quality. Now that Amazon owns Whole Foods, they can think long-term, invest in the future, and leverage access to unlimited amounts of capital. My pitch, buy Gotham Greens for a bill or two, build rooftop farms on the majority of the 460 Whole Foods stores, and then start building additional capacity on the roofs of Amazon distribution centers. Amazon could take Gotham Greens technology and scale it to replace all of Whole Foods 365 lettuce and eventually expand into other crops and disrupt the entire produce industry. Given Amazon is clearly committed to selling food and lots of it by purchasing Whole Foods, they should vertically integrate, grow the food, dig the moat deeper. Buy Gotham Greens or build out the infrastructure themselves. Just do it. The technology is ready for prime time and the world needs it. I don't think it's a coincidence Jeff Bezos' personal venture fund, Bezos Expeditions, is funding Plenty, a hydroponic farming startup very similar to Gotham Greens. The secret is out. Do some good with all that power, Amazon. Buy Gotham Greens. If you're going to disrupt and dominate the food system, do it sustainably. If you don't, it won't be long before Walmart starts building farms on top of their stores. The GMO debate. I'm not against GMOs, genetically modified organisms. I'm against the GMO industrial complex. Yes, I'm talking about Monsanto. It's not that I have a problem eating GMOs because I'm worried they will adversely affect my personal health, although it may. I'll let people smarter than me debate this. I have a problem eating GMOs because I have a problem with the way that 99% of them are grown. Personally, it's not a health issue, it's an environmental issue. Monsanto locks farmers into their proprietary seed and fertilizer ecosystem. Once you start using them, it's really hard to stop. It heavily incentivizes monocrop farming, it requires spraying massive amounts of pesticides that leach into the soil and then our water supply, and ruin neighboring farms who aren't using Monsanto products. None of this is part of a food system I support. Travel. Airbnb has already done so much good and they are just getting started. Experiencing new cultures is cheaper and easier than ever before. Platforms like Airbnb, along with the internet in general, are making it easier to navigate new countries, explore new cities, and immerse yourself with locals. It's a game changer. This is a perfect example of how technology is dramatically improving an aspect of life that can really move the needle on happiness. Moonshot Monday. Airbnb launches an airline. The entire experience of getting to an airport, going through security, riding on a plane is ripe for disruption. It sucks. It's the biggest pain point to traveling and therefore the biggest friction on Airbnb's addressable market of tourism. Airbnb could either buy an airline, a reverse merger with one that's already public would also be an IPO fast track, hashtag two birds with one stone, or just build its own from the ground up. I'm talking create a new terminal. Better food, cleaner, cozier, more comfortable, curate the entire experience from leaving your home to stepping foot in somebody else's home halfway across the world. Fashion. I've started at least three t-shirt businesses that have all failed in the eyes of society, but frankly, I'm just getting started. All of these failures will be the foundational building blocks of my success. Clothes are an intimate expression of identity. They are personally curated art pieces we display for everybody to see. They are the first impression, real world landing page of your personal brand. Whether it's I'm wearing sweatpants to be comfy and I don't give a fuck what you think, or I'm wearing a Supreme t-shirt to hide my insecurity that I might not be cool, you're making a statement. 90%, probably more, of mainstream fashion brands profit on the back of cheap, forced labor, and pollutive ingredients. That's why starting a great t-shirt company is so hard. If you really want to do it right, you need to reinvent the whole supply chain. Beyond using unsustainable raw ingredients, cheap, 
cheap tees with generic screen printed logos priced depending on Instagram marketing prowess is the depressing norm for being a trend setting brand. This is an industry with massive negative externalities we fail to appreciate. In many ways, it's the most poignant example of our excessive materialism. The bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. We are an exciting inflection point in fashion. It needs to hyperchange. It will. Startups, Modern Meadow, Remake, Allbirds, etc., are already beginning to tackle some of the industry's biggest challenges. Beyond drastically reducing the environmental footprint of clothing production, we need to rethink our ideologies surrounding clothing consumption. The amount of clothes people buy, accumulate, and collect is absurd. Closets full of clothes we never wear. A way to fix this is to foster a deeper connection between individuals and each piece of clothing they own. Make people appreciate, cherish, and maximize the utility of every product. Self-driving cars. The hype on fully self-driving cars has been overdone in the near term. Even Elon Musk thinks we're at least two to three years away. I think we're a lot closer to 10 before fully self-driving cars become a mass market reality. Either way, it's not a matter of if, but rather when. So let's get to the fun stuff. The implications of autonomous vehicle technology go far beyond making Ubers cheaper. Cities are designed with transportation first. Manhattan is a tiny cramped island with 1.7 million people and the only space where we don't have massive skyscrapers is where we allow a nonstop congestion of polluting cars to drive. The entire real estate ecosystem is in for a mega rebalancing. Getting from A to B is a massive societal pain point that we blindly accept. Commuting for hours in traffic, standing, probably sweating on a packed subway car, sitting on a dirty, bumpy bus. If you're not walking to work, there's a good chance your commute sucks. Parking lots will become irrelevant. Traffic will decrease. Commutes will become shorter and more pleasant. Driving will be much safer. There is a lot to be excited about here. Transportation will look a lot different in 50 years. We are in the midst of two massive revolutions, electrification and autonomy. The opportunity has been deemed tantalizing enough for Apple, Google, Uber, Tesla, and many more to throw billions of dollars at developing the technology behind this. But it's not just cars that will go autonomous. Trucks, planes, boats, you name it. It's coming to everything that carries goods or people. Whether we're in flying cars or shooting through underground tunnels at 150 miles an hour, the future can't come fast enough. Space. You want to wake up in the morning and think that the future is going to be great. And that's what being a spacefaring civilization is all about. It's about believing in the future and thinking that the future will be better than the past. And I can't think of anything more exciting than going out there and being among the stars. Elon Musk. We are going to colonize Mars and probably a lot sooner than you, th than you realize. Elon's rocket company SpaceX is targeting sending a cargo mission to Mars in 2022 and a manned mission to Mars in 2024. That's right, we are less than a decade away from sending people to Mars. Fucking epic. Star Wars and Star Trek aren't just awesome fictional masterpieces. They are a preview of our multiplanetary future. Humanity needs a cause to rally around, a future to get excited and inspired about. I think this is it. Creating a branch of civilization on Mars will be the biggest power move we've made as a species ever. A lot of people are frustrated by the assumed beef between billionaires Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, but I love it. They're fighting tooth and nail to be the first one to colonize space. Competition breeds innovation. Bezos is already selling a billion dollars worth of Amazon stock per year to fund his rocket company, Blue Origin. Elon Musk will probably start doing the same to fund SpaceX when Tesla begins producing positive cash flow. My guess is 2019 or 2020. The biggest breakthrough in this field has been reusable rocket technology. Prior to SpaceX, rockets were one and done. You launched it, cargo was delivered, and then it crashed into the ocean or blew up somewhere in space, and that was it. Want to launch something else? Build a whole new rocket. Elon has redefined this entire equation. SpaceX can now launch a rocket, deliver cargo, and then reland that same rocket on a drone ship in the ocean. After a quick refurbishment and refueling, it's ready to launch again. This is a game changer. Reusable rockets have the potential to drop the cost of a launch from hundreds of millions to five million, more than an order of magnitude improvement. With rapidly falling launch costs, the possibilities for what we can do in space continue to compound. One example is SpaceX's proposed low orbit satellite network that will provide internet everywhere on the planet, dubbed Starlink, and eventually enable communication between Earth and Mars. Asteroid mining is another exciting tangential industry that reusable rockets enable. There is a finite amount of natural resources we can exploit on Earth. Eventually, we'll need to tap into space to satiate our demand for raw materials. The company with the cheapest launch costs will have an edge here too. Neuralink. 
If Elon Musk is right about one of his most futuristic projects, we are going to be living in a Black Mirror episode sooner rather than later. Potentially a great-grandson of the smartphone, embedded neurological devices will be the start of humanity going officially symbiotic with AI. On its website, the Neuralink describes its technology as the following. Neuralink is developing ultra-high bandwidth brain-machine interfaces to connect humans and computers. This is some scary shit. Basically, your brain is directly tied to the internet and an artificial intelligence platform. The overarching premise of this bionic innovation is to protect us. Elon Musk fears that AI will become so powerful, our only chance at survival will be to integrate it into our own bodies. So of course, he's creating a company to do just that. It's called Neuralink. Beyond further commoditizing access to the knowledge of the internet, this will have immense, immense social implications. Recording every memory you ever experience via all five senses and then storing it in the cloud. You think getting hacked now is a nightmare. This is some unreal shit, and frankly I hope I die before these implants become the norm. Maybe that's the Luddite in me. Regardless, it's important to understand where we're headed. All the rest. There's so much more. Genetics, biotech, physics, AI, and all the rest of the deep tech I can't understand. It's moving at lightning speed. The amount of exciting cutting edge shit happening now is epic. It's worth taking a step back to appreciate. Even old school industries like painting, music, photography are all going through massive disruption in their own way. Nothing is safe from hyperchange. We are at the cusp of a new renaissance. Some thoughts on the future. In the way that the Medicis, Borgias, and Florence's elite funded a creative explosion in the arts and science 500 years ago, we are about to enter a parallel era with an order of magnitude more potential. An explosion of science and art. We are already seeing the early stages. The Sergi Brins, Jeff Bezos's, Elon Musk's, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett's have compounded an absurd amount of money in their lifetimes. And they are probably going to keep getting richer until they die. No pressure, but it's on the shoulders of these modern day Rockefellers to start funding the future. Making definitive progress towards slowing the rate of climate change, saving us, implementing electronic voting systems, democratizing us, promoting equality socially and socioeconomically, leveling the playing field. These are just a few of the critical issues that the morally conscious financiers and barons of our era have the opportunity to tackle. I hope the next hundred years are as exciting as they have the potential to be. People need to start living up to their creative potential. That's why Kanye West is so inspiring to me. His music is vertically integrated. He can produce and rap and therefore he can create his own unique sound and is completely authentic. Kanye can go zero to one. This is why he can and has pioneered entirely new genres of hip hop and music. Even his shows, he designs the set and crafts the visuals. He's transferring this artistic touch to clothing with an Adidas partnership where I can guarantee he's being underpaid given his halo effect on the brand. Partnerships like this will only get more common in the future. Beyond that, he describes ambitions for architecture and more. We need more Kanye's. We need more people funding Kanye's. More public art, bigger scientific projects, more experiments. I don't know. Just start investing in creators. The internet has made discovering today's most talented artists instantaneous. We are all watching them make history in real time. The reinventing of our infrastructure in the name of sustainability opens the door to enormous creative opportunities. Self-driving cars means the parking lots dominating the landscape of suburbia are suddenly a blank canvas. Micro farms, reforestation, studio space, R&D labs, massive statues. It's up to us. Giga greenhouses. These could glow purple, blue, or red. Twist and grow to the sky like beautiful food-producing forests. Going to Mars, living in space, exploring new planets. There's so much opportunity to build an inspiring future. Hyperchange. Tesla and Amazon. Tesla. Story time. In my sophomore year of high school, I was on the debate team. My partner was AJ. The topic of the year, or whatever prompt we had to debate, was proposing a solution to climate change. We schemed on this for hours and eventually came up with an epic plan. We were going to build massive genetically modified algae farms in the middle of the Arizona desert to intake enormous amounts of greenhouse gases, then process that algae as biofuel and create a more sustainable transportation system. This idea had a million problems and we didn't have the first clue about science, but we knew that a transportation system based on fossil fuels was bullshit. Shortly after, I discovered Tesla and realized Elon Musk had come up with a far better solution. 
create the sexiest, fastest, most long-range electric cars on the planet and force going green on the world by making Tesla's products cooler and more practical than the internal combustion engine. I thought, now that's a hell of a fucking scheme. And I've been hooked on learning more about the company ever since. This is my favorite company. Full disclosure, I'm an Elon Musk fanboy and Tesla shareholder. The biggest challenge we face as a collective humanity over the next century is not destroying the equilibrium of nature. Tesla is making more progress on this initiative than any other entity on the planet. Elon Musk is quickly becoming living proof that one inspired leader can change the course of history. I've been following Tesla for 10 years now, and the progress has been nothing short of astounding. In 2012, when Tesla started selling its luxury sedan, the Model S, the consensus among the world's leading economists, analysts, and experts was that the company would fail because electric vehicles would never go mainstream. Now I sit in 2018 and read headlines every day about how all the major automakers are planning to electrify their entire car lineups as fast as possible. EVs went from impossible to inevitable in half a decade, thanks to Tesla. Tesla combines Apple's detail-oriented product obsession and luxury brand status with Amazon's growth at all costs, vision-first fiscal engineering strategy. This is a powerful combination we've never seen before. The amount of hate that Tesla gets in the media baffles me. I understand there is a structural incentive for people to cover every Tesla event with a negative slant if they are short the stock, aka will profit if Tesla goes bankrupt. But the skepticism, judgment, and negativity seems to permeate far beyond that. Do you not believe the world needs to transition off of fossil fuels? Does the incredible David vs. Goliath story of a nobody Silicon Valley startup single-handedly taking down the oil industrial complex not inspire you? Whatever. The haters aren't worth my time. Tesla currently sells three cars. The Model S, $70,000 luxury sedan. The Model X, a $70,000 luxury seat SUV. And the Model 3, a $35,000 plus sedan. Additionally, the company has announced plans to produce the Model Y, Roadster 2.0, the Tesla Semi, an electric heavy duty truck, and eventually a pickup. But Tesla isn't just making electric cars and trucks. The mission to accelerate the transition away from fossil fuels involves much bigger plans. If we are all driving electric vehicles, we will need a lot more energy. Combine that with the fact that the majority of the US's power comes from coal, natural gas, and oil, and you've got a major problem. Or opportunity, depending on who you ask. A drastic increase in energy demand will require a sustainable way to produce and deliver that power. Enter Tesla Energy. Tesla is building the world's largest battery factory in Nevada, the Gigafactory. Yes, this will pump out batteries for cars, but perhaps more importantly, it will make the batteries to store energy to power the rest of our lives. Batteries are the missing link that allow the renewable energy sources we need to power our future, solar, wind, geothermal, to be practical. The sun isn't always shining and the wind isn't always blowing. To smooth out these intermittent power sources, you need batteries to store energy and deliver it when needed. It's a whole ecosystem, electric car in the garage, solar on your roof, and a battery tying it all together. That is why Tesla bought SolarCity. They want to sell you this package of complete sustainability. This trifecta is the fossil fuel killer. As the cost of batteries and solar panels continue to drop, Tesla's renewable energy solutions are getting more competitive by the day. At this point, the momentum is irreversible. We are going green and there's nothing you can do about it. Morals were great, but now economics are on Tesla's side too. People will be studying Tesla and the multi-industry disruption it is catalyzing for hundreds of years into the future. The fact that we are witnessing it play out in real time is in beyond incredible. Tesla is hyperchange. The investing bull case. The bull thesis is Apple of cars. The high margin luxury status symbol that can't captures 10% of the industry's market share and 90% of the profit. But frankly, the vision is bigger. Tesla extends beyond the consumer piece. Rebuilding the electric grid is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity that accompanies the EV revolution. But frankly, I don't even need to include that business line to justify the current valuation. Tesla's market capitalization is 55 billion, AKA what it's worth in the public markets. In line with Ford and GM, both around 50 to 60 billion. Ford and GM sell millions of cars per year. Tesla sold 103,000 in 2017. Ford and GM are profitable and trade at less than 0.5 times 2017 sales. Tesla trades at five times 2017 sales. Most skeptics point out how this makes utterly no sense. I think it makes perfect sense. 
fair warning, I'm a little, I'm about to finance nerd out a little bit. This is how I see it all playing out. And keep in mind, this is probably crazy wrong. Tesla is on track to sell its cars significantly more profitably than any other automaker, made by robots with cheaper and better batteries. This will add hundreds of incremental basis points to its gross margin relative to every other auto company. Additionally, nobody else has begun to replicate Tesla's direct-to-consumer, Apple-esque retail model. At scale, this revolutionary distribution approach will add hundreds of incremental basis points in operating leverage to the company's SG&A line. Relative to legacy dealerships and franchise inventory model that was built pre-internet, Tesla has appropriately reinvented selling cars for the new digital era. Vertically integrating down to the consumer touchpoint is a major edge. It allows Tesla to control the purchasing experience all the way down to the last drop, an essential element of any luxury brand. Tesla is already one of the world's most successful retails in terms of sales per square foot, in the ballpark with Apple and Tiffany's. And they haven't even begun starting to sell their most popular product yet, the Model 3. Wait until this hits scale. The unit economics of Tesla's business will start to get really, really fun. This is the biggest flaw in pointing out Tesla's glaring losses and assuming they will last in perpetuity. The company isn't built to be profitable selling 100,000 cars per year. They have designed their business model and infrastructure, stores, superchargers, service centers, to support millions of cars on the road. If these sales never materialize, the business model will flop completely. If they do, we will see enormous operating leverage where revenue growth dwarfs expense growth over the next five years. Moving to the next line of the income statement. Tesla's R&D expenses are massively inflated relative to my projections for the long-term norm at this point in their business model. They are still so early in launching vehicles and products that we don't have a good grasp of what is being used to fund improving existing vehicles, the Model S and X, and what is being used to develop everything else. With so much in the works that isn't being sold yet, Model 3, Semi, Model Y, etc., current R&D expenses are grossly inflated on a percentage of revenue basis. My stance is, in the longer term, the culmination of these factors will drive gross margins of 30% and operating margins of 10% plus in Tesla's automotive business. If Tesla fulfills its vision and launches Model S, X, 3, Y, Roadster 2, the Semi, and Model P, I think the company could be selling 3 million cars in 2024 at an average price of 65000 This would equate to $195 billion in revenue, $58.5 billion in growth, gross profit, and $19.5 billion in operating income. Slap a 10x multiple on those earnings, and you have a car business worth $195 billion, or about 3.5x more than today's valuation of $55 billion. That's where I think we can get in six years with great execution. And this valuation includes nothing about solar roofs, the ones that already have a year-long wait list, massive solar farms like the one powering Kauai, or massive batteries like the one installed in South Australia. Oh, and this thing called the Tesla network that is like Uber without a driver, self-driving Tesla robot taxis, which some analysts think is another trillion dollar opportunity. So that's why Tesla being worth as much as GM or Ford makes sense to me. They publicly laid out a business plan that will create a company multiples the size of these legacy automakers. Another factor at play is Tesla's impending success and market share gains are being priced into the market. GM and, F GM and Ford are selling a lot of cars now, but that's before they start to compete head on with Tesla. The market is forward looking and realizes these earning streams will take a massive hit and is therefore discounting the PE multiples of legacy automakers appropriately. This is the Apple of the auto world, and the iPhone Model 3 hasn't even launched yet. Eventually, I think Tesla will use its battery technology to build planes, boats, delivery drones, and so much more. Buying equity in the company is like owning a call option on Elon Musk's inventions with no expiration. He's only 46. We are so early in seeing this vision play out. I can't wait to see what Tesla looks like in 25 years. The investment risk. Simply put, Tesla is a risky investment. The company is burning a lot of money per quarter, has a significant amount of debt, and isn't likely to produce significant cash flow for a few years. For this reason, Tesla is heavily reliant on raising money for the, from the capital markets to fund its ongoing operations. This is fine in happy times, but a death sentence in an 08 scenario. The real question is, can Tesla pull this off before some shit hits the fan? I think they can, and in their back pocket are investors like Sergey Brin, Larry Page, Ron Barron, Tencent, and more, who I have a feeling would be more than willing to invest in a do-or-die scenario. Either way, it's important to note that this is not a sure thing. Both bankruptcy and becoming the world's largest automaker are closer than ever. Amazon. 
Jeff Bezos' empire is a financial arbitrage machine. The Seattle tech giant is pioneering an entirely new style of running a public corporation. Despite being worth over half a trillion US dollars and growing revenue to over 200 billion in 2018, Amazon has never made a substantial profit, and as a result, nor has it paid any notable income taxes to speak of. What's frightening is that not a single one of Amazon's competitors enjoys this luxury. Walmart, Costco, Target, and the rest of them are required to show positive earnings and pay shareholders cold hard cash in the form of a dividend each quarter. Amazon has none of this friction and chooses to forego profits so they can sell you stuff cheaper than anybody else. That's why, they're taking, that's why they are taking so much market share and seem almost impossible to stop. Whether this represents a permanent inflection point in investors' ability to value vision over profits, or is an ephemeral phenomena propped up by historically low interest rates, is yet to be seen. Regardless, this is one of the most important case studies in both business and financial history, along with Tesla. Amazon has access to unlimited capital at unbeatable prices, and they aren't afraid to use it. The goal of most businesses is to launch a product, make money from it, and return that money to investors. Amazon's goal seems to be far different. It's global domination. No industry is safe, growth at all costs, just keep getting bigger. Valuation metrics that built the career of Warren Buffett fall by the wayside to the seemingly irrational rise in Amazon's market value. Bezos has rattled the very core of investors' perception of valuation. How has he gotten away with this? Bezos has built remarkable trust with his investors. Amazon shareholders blindly accept that any market Amazon chooses to enter will inevitably be conquered. Just by announcing an entrance into an industry, competing stocks begin to suffer. It's become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Amazon says they want to enter a market, then their share price rises, they leverage that rising share price to hire top talent and convince the market of their impending success. Although this seems crazy, it has quite a bit of merit. The company has gone from online bookstore to monopolizing e-commerce to accumulating 90 million plus Prime memberships to running the world's largest cloud computing service and to soon be dominating the world of physical retail stores as well. Bezos fucking executes. That's it. While Bezos' success as an entrepreneur is undeniable, Amazon has a darker side. The company has made strong commitments to renewable energy, which is great, but is also fostering in an oddly dystopian future. They make consumption so easy, it seems ridiculous not to buy more stuff. As Amazon quietly builds a Netflix competitor as well, you have to ask what their vision for the future is. You're either sedated watching a screen or yelling at Alexa to deliver you more stuff. Sure, it's cheaper, faster, and more efficient than ever. But in its current form, Amazon is accelerating excess gluttony and materialism. These are the exact habits we so desperately need to reverse. The challenge of getting what you want when you want it is forcing Amazon to innovate. The company has patented some insane futuristic logistic technologies. Drone beehives, floating blimps that double as warehouses and drone docking and charging stations. Underground tunnels that shoot packages across our cities. Autonomous trucks and highway systems. It's anybody's guess how this all plays out. But if there's one thing I can say for sure, it's that Amazon Prime will keep delivering packages faster and faster. In some ways, it's a race to zero. Maybe it will take the extreme of being able to buy everything and have it appear instantaneously to realize we never needed any of this crap in the first place. Investing in Amazon. Go look at the first line, that's not legal disclosure, of Amazon's Q3 2017 earnings PR. It's no coincidence that operating cash flow is the first stat they choose to highlight. The trailing 12-month figure is $17.1 billion. Based on a current market capitalization of $600 billion, that's a 35 times multiple on trailing operating cash flow. This is Amazon's P-E ratio, and it seems pretty normal if you get over the fact that we're not talking about earnings. Revenue growth continues at 25% after all. Amazon is telling a story of compounding earnings power. The perception that they could be massively profitable at a moment's notice is how they get away with it. Instead of making $17 billion this year and keeping it in the bank, we are reinvesting it as fast as possible so we can make $22 billion next year. If the market keeps buying into this psychology, I think they will if Amazon keeps growing, it's easy to extrapolate how the company's valuation passes a trillion in the next few years. Between e-commerce, still under 10% of total retail sales, physical retails, Whole Foods plus no line, domination, AWS, AI robots or data monsters, Amazon has exposure to a trifecta of tailwinds that will propel growth across its core businesses for the foreseeable future. Amazon is on pace to hit $20 billion in operating cash flow in 2018. By 2020, they could be well past $30 billion. 
As it becomes clear operating cash flow will surpass 30 billion and still has significant growth ahead, Amazon's market capitalization will hit 1 trillion, assuming the market can continue justifying a 30x operating cash flow multiple. I can't see what's going to stop Amazon. Sure, maybe regulation will eventually break up the company, but it's anybody's guess that that will be able to stop the growth machine Bezos has created. Amazon doesn't really make a profit in the normal sense of the word, but their operating cash flow will get them through any recession. Amazon has $24 billion of cash and market is marketable securities on its balance sheet. They aren't going anywhere. My gut feeling is $1 trillion will be a cute milestone, but Amazon won't stop there. Consumption knows no limit. With Bezos at the helm, this company's moat seems to get stronger every day. This thing could go to $5 trillion in the next 20 years. The Achilles heel of Amazon, if there is one, is the company's stock-based compensation system. This is how they hire the smartest people and incentivize them to work harder than the competition. With a stock price that's always rising, this is a beautiful system. If the narrative on Amazon changes and a falling share price makes employees think twice about the value of their equity compensation, things could get dicey. Stock-based compensation for the trailing 12 months ending September 2017 was $3.9 billion. That's about 0.7% of Amazon's market capitalization and therefore doesn't really cost the company shit. If Amazon's stock gets cut in half, it goes up to 1.4%. Still not much, but you get the point. It would take a me mega move, like 75% down, for this to become a problem. But still, the possibility is out there. At the end of the day, a company is just a group of people. If Amazon keeps its ability to hire and motivate the world's smartest engineers and employees, it will keep winning. If for some reason that system stops working, it will be the start of the company's downfall. Investing. Why invest? Why care? There are two main factors behind a decision to invest. The first is obvious, to make a return on your investment, aka make money. The second is rarer, but far more powerful, because you want to see something happen in the world. In a best case scenario, you are getting involved for both. Money is magic, the bridge that takes an invention from idea to reality. Cities can be built, diseases can be cured, new technologies can be commercialized, people can be motivated, and art can be born. It makes the impossible possible. It gets a bad rap, but as a tool, currency is an essential part of our world and perhaps one of civilization's greatest inventions. The phrase, putting money to work, doesn't get enough play. Your wealth can sit nascent in a savings account at Bank of America, or you can invest in companies who have products and ideas that you believe in. The future is an open book waiting to be written. Start writing. What is possible for humanity to achieve over the next 50 years is limited only by our collective imagination. I implore you to leverage your capital to advance the future you want to live in. Where you invest your money matters. Wall Street, the business of putting people in business. Yes, the corporate culture of Wall Street is destruct destructive, toxic, and I fucking hate bankers. But the service they provide is in many ways the most important pillar of our society. Financial engineering is a science that rarely gets discussed or appreciated. Remember, money is magic. Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs, and countless other world-class innovators have leveraged this system to commercialize their revolutionary ideas. This isn't a coincidence. The business of putting people in business isn't going away. And the great news is the bad guys are getting disrupted. Fintech startups like Robinhood, Wealthfront, Stripe, and Square have been knocking at the door for years and are only gaining more traction. These companies are empowering people like us. Beyond startup disruption, blockchain is about to disrupt all the back office Wall Street bullshit more than you could ever imagine. Starting a company, getting funding, and building your vision is getting easier every day. This is the service Wall Street provides. Whether it's an asshole in a suit, the past, or a piece of software, the future, every entrepreneur needs Wall Street. As an individual investor, you are a critical piece of this e ecosystem. You're at the end of the line. The life cycle of a company's ownership goes from entrepreneur to the suits to the public. We might be the smallest fish, but in many ways we're at the top of the food chain. If we don't bite, nobody's getting paid. You're already an economist. Every cup of coffee you buy is a big deal. Think about the company behind that product, the supply chain that got it to you, the farmer who grew the beans, the barista who foamed your milk, the cow that gave that milk, the farmer who took care of the cow, the trucking company that made the logistics happen. What are the values of the enterprises you are supporting? Are they focused on improving sustainability across their business or improving profit or both? What is their why? The economic intricacies of your morning latte are so complex that careers are built off them, Howard Schultz, and billions are made, Starbucks. 
Every time you go to Starbucks, you're investing in growing their business or returning capital to their shareholders. Think through these consequences. You are already an economist. Every purchase you make is a subconsciously calculated equation to maximize some balance between short and long-term happiness. Own that. Start reverse engineering your own purchasing decisions. Why did I get Starbucks even though I love the cafe down the street? It was closer, faster, slightly cheaper, and I didn't need to have that awkward conversation with the barista. There are miles of insight from every move you make. Start analyzing. The intuition surrounding your purchasing decisions is the best way of understanding a company, product, or service. Be the customer. To win at investing, you need to be an expert in the business you're investing in. The easiest way to do this is invest in the things you're already an expert in. These are most likely the companies that sell the products and services that you use every day. For instance, if you buy things on Amazon regularly, you know how great of a retailer it is. If the day ever comes where you find yourself shopping on Walmart's revamped e-commerce platform, you know the competitive landscape is changing. Another example, I used to love Chipotle. It was my favorite restaurant and I would walk 25 minutes away to wait in line 10 minutes to get a burrito and it was so worth it. Now there's a Chipotle less than a two minute walk from my apartment with no line ever and I have not gone in months. The guac is brown. The quality has fallen off a cliff. It's no coincidence Chipotle's share price has suffered a similar fate. A company's greatest asset is its customers. If you are one of them and can feel this bond getting stronger or weaker, that is a powerful clue about the direction of the business. If the day comes where the electric car of my dreams is no longer a Tesla, it will be time for me to question my entire investment thesis. Mentors. Find a mentor who has done everything that you're trying to do. This is true for everything and especially investing. All the books you read, trades you make, and classes you take will make a negligible impact on your investing acumen relative to great mentorship. Finding a great mentor isn't easy, especially if you have no industry connections or experience. Just start asking. Don't stop till you find one. If you're really hungry, then start publishing investment research, blogs, reports, podcasts, videos, books, whatever floats your boat. If you show enough hustle, progress, and talent, a mentor might just come to you. I've had five mentors in my investing career and every single one has been priceless. There's no question I owe the bulk of my investing success to them. This isn't Buffett's stock market. Warren Buffett grew up investing in a different era. What got him to be where he's at is will not get you to where you want to be. The internet has made it exponentially faster to research any company or trend. Within seconds of Googling, every public company's SEC filings are at your fingertips. Reading The Intelligent Investor and studying the valuation methods of Benjamin Graham are important building blocks of understanding today's markets, but fail to answer the pressing questions of modern finance. The P-E ratio and book value are a joke these days, although they are important to understand. These, sim these simplistic lenses of analysis cannot begin to accurately assess the value of today's most influential companies. Firms are being rung differently. The internet exists, and so does this thing called software. Take advantage of this. Tweets, Instagram comments, Reddit threads, snaps are all avenues of understanding today's biggest companies and their customers. There is a wealth of information at your fingertips accessible in seconds. This is the new frontier of DD. Financial statements are lagging indicators of purchasing decisions. Social media engagement is a leading indicator of purchasing decisions. Things get really fun when the market is driving looking in the rearview mirror and you're not. Social media data is the most underrated DD on Wall Street at least for now. We still probably have a couple years before this really goes mainstream. It's not just amount of followers anymore. It's engagement and organic engagement at that. Knowing what brands are paying for distribution and which brands are getting distribution from their customers is huge. It's the clearest indicator of what companies are desperate and which are not. No matter what company or sector you're investing in, somewhere on the internet is a really valuable piece of research that most people aren't looking at. Just gotta start digging. No shortcuts. Investing isn't for everybody. If you don't want to put in your 10,000 hours, you won't be good. It's like anything in life. For some reason, because everybody needs to make money, everybody thinks they need to learn how to invest. And while I'm all for people learning, the bulk of the time it's as a side hustle. Everyone's trying to get rich quick. That never works. The amount of times I hear people hyping up some oil stock, high-tech chip company, or anything in an industry they don't understand is baffling. It's frustrating as fuck. You're not going to make a quick buck by investing in some shit your homie or colleague told you to buy because it's a hot stock or crypto asset. And if you do, you're not smart. You're lucky. That's not investing. That's gambling. Do your own homework. Go to sec.gov. Start reading filings. You will be the 1%. 
SEC filings are the first principles of finance. Reading and understanding them thoroughly is the best research you can do on any company. Work, 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 work. That's the secret to being a great investor. DD equals due diligence. Wall Street slang for doing enough homework on a company to convince most people in the room you know what you're talking about. Do your DD. Oh, and one more thing. Everybody wants to be rich without doing shit. When you invest, most of the time you're battling the smartest minds in the world with access to magnitudes more resources than you. If you think beating them is easy, you're in for a rude awakening. Breaking down an investment. Number one, the business. What does the company do? What are they selling? How do they make money? What's the product? Is it good? Are customers happy? Is this something that will be around for the next decade? Is it getting more or less relevant by the day? Understanding a company in and out is the most important part of investing. Before diving into the financials, you've got to know what you're looking at. The best way to do this is to either be a customer or know a customer. Starbucks sells coffee, Tesla sells electric cars, Apple sells iPhones. Figure out what a company does and if they are good at it. You will have to be an expert on the business to have an edge investing over the broader market. Two, leadership. The most important metric any company has will not be found on its balance sheet, income statement, or cash flows. It's leadership. Strategic decisions, company culture, what moves to make when shit hits the fan, and all the rest are on the shoulders of leadership. It's amazing how little research or coverage is done on a CEO's background. A track record of big wins or losses can tell you a lot about what to expect. If there's one pattern I've seen, it's that winning CEOs keep winning and losing CEOs keep losing. Beyond a track record, the most important thing to understand about leadership is what their incentives are. Aligning incentives between shareholders and management is critical to the long-term success of any business. The simplest way to achieve this is to have the CEO own a lot of stock. For instance, Elon Musk takes no salary from Tesla, but owns a multi-billion dollar stake in the company's common stock. When I buy a share of Tesla, I'm buying the same asset that Elon Musk has chosen to allocate the bulk of his net worth to other than SpaceX. I fuck with that. His motivation is to create a long-term value for shareholders, AK Innovate, because he is one. Contrast that with the incentives of the CEOs of other US automakers. They are not the founders. They are paid multi-million dollar salaries that often dwarf their positions in the company's common stock. Their motivation is to keep the status quo and collect paychecks, aka stagnate. Do your homework on the CEO and figure out what their goals are. Hint, most of them want to take as little risk as possible and retire rich. Contra contrast that with Elon Musk who wants to transition the world off fossil fuels. Guess who I'm betting on to build the future? Three, revenue. The top of every financial statement starts with revenue. How much money does the business bring in before accounting for any costs? The more a company brings in, the more that can potentially flow to its bottom line. That is why consistent growth is often a valid excuse for a lack of profitability, at least in this market. This is the most basic and the first financial metric to understand. How many, widget is, how many widgets is this company selling and how much revenue is that bringing in? Is it up, business is growing, or down, business is shrinking from last year? Number four, earnings, AKA profit. Revenue is great, and a lot of it, growing fast, is really great. But that's just the first test. Now we're getting deeper. Are they profitable? Everybody's overthinking financials. Sure, financial statements have a million lines and look really complicated, but when you boil things down, it gets pretty simple. Businesses have two states, cash producing or cash burning. Producing cash isn't necessarily a good thing, and burning cash isn't necessarily a bad thing. There are millions of reasons why a company could be losing money. Maybe it's just a crappy business that isn't providing any value. Maybe management is thinking long-term and sacrificing near-term profits to build a moat. As a general rule of thumb, startups burn capital because they're investing in the future, growth, and mature companies generate cash because they are paying back the past, investors. The metric I personally track to gauge profitability is EBIT, aka earnings before interest or taxes, sometimes referred to as operating income. EBIT tells me if the company made money or not in a given period. In my opinion, it's the closest thing to the core earnings of the business. There are a lot of other metrics that constitute Wall Street slang for profit. EBITDA, net income, NOPAT, etc. They're all slightly different and it would take me hours to explain the nuances that make up each one. But across the board, the gist is the same. They will tell you if the business made or lost money, aka the business's earnings. For simplicity, my rule of thumb is to pick one and use it for every business you analyze. At least that will make it consistent. 
Tesla's EBIT is negative. The company is on track to post an operating loss of about 1.5 billion in 2017. You might be wondering how a company could be worth 50 billion plus if it's losing 1.5 billion per year. Here's my reasoning. Tesla is in startup mode. I'm okay with Tesla making no profit today because I think they're investing to generate significant profits in the future. This is a great example of why gla glancing at the profit of a business in one year is only scratching the surface. It's fundamental to understand whether a business is making or, or losing money at a moment in time, but the trajectory of that profit or loss is the true determinant of value. Number five, valuation, predicting the future. So now we have a basic understanding of what a company does, how much money it's bringing in, and how much of that is flowing to the bottom line. Now it's time to figure out what to pay for it. This is the really, really hard part that Nobel Prizes are given out for because no one knows what the answer is. The most commonly accepted framework to gauge a company's valuation is the PE or price earnings ratio. This will tell you the multiple you are paying for a company's annual profits. If firm ABC is trading at $20 per share price and it earned $1 per share earnings, its PE ratio is 20x, 20 divided by one. It may sound tricky at first, but it's pretty straightforward. Historically, the S&P 500, an index of the 500 largest publicly traded U.S. companies, trades at a P.E. ratio of 15 to 20x. From January 1971 to June 2017, the S&P 500 averaged a P.E. ratio of 19.4x. Most people accept this as the standard or what a normal valuation should be. Let's think about that for a second. On average, the market values businesses at 19.4 times the profit they generate in a single year. Extrapolating this me methodology, if your lemonade stand generates 500 in profit per year, it would be worth $9,700 at a PE ratio of 19.4x. No one might rationally conclude that any business trading at a PE ratio higher than 19.4 is overvalued, and any business trading at a PE below 19.4 is undervalued. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Remember, at a PE ratio of 19.4, you're paying for almost 20 years worth of profits. That's a long time. What would you rather own? Lemonade stand A, that is doing $0 in profit this year, but 1,000 next year and 2,000 the year after that? Or Lemonade Stand B, that is doing $500 in profit this year, will do $500 in profit next year, and continue to earn $500 in profit in perpetuity. In the first scenario, Lemonade Stand A, you would accumulate $3,000 in earnings after three years. In the second scenario, Lemonade Stand B, you would accumulate $1,500 in the same period. This illustrates the importance of future earnings trajectory over current earnings. Future earnings far outweigh the current earnings and past earnings are almost irrelevant. Just because a business is profitable today doesn't mean it will be tomorrow. To help better rationalize my personal investments, I use a back of the napkin formula I call years to payback, YTP. How many years would it take for a company to return the entire value of my investment in profit? Let's say both lemonade stand A and B from the scenario before are trading at a price of 3,000. The YTP of lemonade stand A is three years and the YTP of lemonade stand B is six years. And my assumptions about the trajectory of their future profits are correct. I would say lemonade stand A is a far better investment despite having much lower current earnings. All of this is guesswork. There are far more granular ways to calculate the value of companies like discounted cash flow models, for instance, but they all boil down to the same thing. It's art, not science. Stocks are stories. The hard part isn't calculating the P-E ratio, the YTP, or making a DCF. The hard part is accurately forecasting how the market's perception of those future financial scenarios will change. It's fucking meta. If you really want to be a master at financial markets, you have to be a master at human psychology. You are not guessing what assets are worth. You're guessing what people will guess assets are worth in the future. The most intense number crunching on Wall Street is a manifestation of covering up insecurities related to this perplexing question. What is a company worth? Nobody can accurately model a company's financials five years into the future. The crux is that people buy products and you can't model people. Business is art. Businesses have the power to affect millions of people and profoundly impact the course of society. The most complex form of art is a corporation. You're building the machine that makes the machine. Yeah, I stole that from Elon Musk. Every business is a movement to accomplish a goal. It is as cross-disciplinary as possible, truly a renaissance man's endeavor, orchestrating groups of people to accomplish a mission in harmony. This is how global progress happens. Much like art, passion is the most important part of business. If you are not deeply inspired and motivated, your chances of greatness are slim. As a founder, you're guiding inspiration at every turn. 
Elon Musk's engineering smarts, understanding of physics, charisma are all legendary, but I'd argue they have nothing on his creativity. At his core, in many ways, he is an artist. The only thing up for debate is whether Tesla or SpaceX will be his pièce de résistance. Never stop learning. The best investing theories, formulas, and philosophies have yet to be discovered. The day you think you know it all is the day you lose. This is why crypto assets are so fascinating. Nobel Prizes are waiting to be claimed. This book should leave you with more questions than answers. Get used to it. That's what investing feels like. Entrepreneurship. This part was tricky to write because although I'm trying to be an entrepreneur, I haven't been successful yet. I'm young and I have a lot to learn, but I have a weird feeling now is a historically unique time for entrepreneurship. So I wanted to share the philosophies that guide me. Anything is possible. This is my life, homie, you decide yours, Kanye West. There has never been a better time to be alive. I mean it, like really. This cannot be understated. Don't get fooled by political turmoil, depressing headlines, or your homie's negativity. The internet at scale is commoditizing the ability to change the world and acquire life-changing wealth for everyone. Following your passion and reaching your dreams has never been easier. I don't care what you want to be or do, it's possible. As far as I can tell, the closest thing there is to a formula is something like this. Hard work plus patience plus a stubborn and accurate vision equals success. Go to Google and you can start learning how to do anything immediately. Libraries and textbooks are no longer the gatekeepers of knowledge. Your hustle is. You could literally start mastering any skill tomorrow if you have access to the internet. Beyond acquiring knowledge, buying tools and supplies is easier and cheaper than ever. Amazon, the world's everything store, is selling exactly what you need to prototype anything and will deliver it in two days at an unbelievable price with just the click of a button. YouTube, plus a smartphone and you can launch your own TV show that is immediately distributed across the entire planet. Instagram isn't just for models. Start posting your art, products, passion, and you can build a fan base and begin to craft a monetizable following around your work. Twitter gives your voice a megaphone to share ideas on politics, sports, technology, or anything around the world instantly. These are all tools that have never existed before and give entrepreneurs incredible power. This should not be taken lightly. More than ever before, our imagination is the only limiting factor to what we can achieve. Be enlightened. Who the hell are you and what the hell is that? Chris Reed. Every business starts with no guap and no believers. Arguably the hardest part of entrepreneurship is being enlightened. Enlightened, per my definition, is believing in your idea before anyone else does. You have to be your first fan. If you're not, nobody will be. When I put out my first YouTube video on hyperchange, it was a bittersweet moment. A couple people liked it, but the overwhelming response from people I admired was that it was a huge mistake. My mentors, who were a lot smarter, more successful, and experienced, did not see the vision. The stubborn anarchist in me used this to add fuel to the fire. I saw the potential. Family, friends, and the world will probably think you are crazy when you go all in on your idea, especially if it's your first real power move, aka some life shit you do on your own volition. Is that a scary concept? Sure. It's why most people never start businesses. Failing. You don't fail when you fail. Chris Reed. Why the fuck is everybody so scared of failing? Failing is such a bad word. It should be reframed as learning. I've tried to start so many companies that just flopped. When I was 14, I made limited edition duct tape wallets and tried to sell them online. My first e-commerce project, colorwallets.com. Didn't even sell a single one, but I learned how to build a website and realized that I could start my own thing. Society counts that as a failure. I count it as the first crucial building block of my entrepreneurial DNA. A few streetwear brands, a penny stock newsletter, a hydroponic farming company, a 3D printed trinket business, a finance news app, an online record label. The amount of things I've started that have failed is epic. Really, my life is just a track record of one crappy startup idea after the next. But all those hours, experiences, and wasted dollars, thousands, are turning out to be priceless. Each failure taught me a lesson. Piece by piece, failure by failure, I taught myself how to be an entrepreneur. Failure is an essential element of success. You won't get anywhere without it. Regret Minimization Framework. This chapter and title and philosophy is 100% copied from Jeff Bezos. He mentioned this mentality in a talk as his reason for starting Amazon, and it's been one of my mantras ever since. The basic idea is take a step back and imagine that you are 80 years old reflecting on your life. You want to minimize the regrets you have, asking that girl you like out, following that crazy gut feeling to start a company, traveling the world, whatever it is. We only get one shot at this thing called life, and it's worth thinking about what you want to do with it. 
Perhaps the scariest thing about life is realizing that it's exactly what you make of it. Free will is real. Stop living for your resume, start living for your legacy. For me, not trying is so much scarier than failing. Knowing that you have the chance, no matter how small, to make an impact, follow your dream, and be an entrepreneur, and not giving it a shot? Nah, I'm doing it. There's only one thing scarier than my family and friends thinking I'm a loser because my dumb idea flopped. It's being 80 years old and realizing that the fear of failure was what held me back from trying to do what I love. Hustle and positivity. You can't control how many times you will get knocked down, but you can control the amount of times you get back up. Nothing is easy. A flip, passive income, a lick, whatever you want to call your get-rich-quick scheme is BS. At the beginning, you need to be resourceful, scrappy, and work your ass off. Hustle is key. So is positivity. Entrepreneurship is one setback and failure after the next. Everything takes twice as long and costs twice as much as you think. Just keep your head up and keep hustling. The second you stop, you lose. Fuck the money. When you're young, you spend time to get money. When you're old, you spend money to get time. Or something like that, said Gary Vee. Money is a tool. I don't want money. I want to do what I want to do. Money helps with that. The amount of my friends who work 9 to 5s that they are not passionate about or inspired by makes me really sad. Sure, most of them are making six figures, buying fancy food, taking dope trips, and seem happy, but I can't help feel like there's an emptiness behind it. There's one thing money can't buy. That's time. If you're under 30 and you don't have a family, you should be taking as much risk as possible. Chasing your dreams and failing, learning, seems like a win-win. You will never get this shot again. You can always take the corporate job later. Cubicles aren't going anywhere. Your chance to change the world might be. Honesty and integrity. It takes a lifetime to build a reputation, but only a moment to ruin one. In elementary school, I sold Jesse Clerman's, J. Clerz, Charizard. I remember the moment like it was yesterday. It was a Friday night and my parents were leaving the Clermans after an epic dinner party. J. Clerz and I had been playing Pokemon all night in his room and I had forgotten my socks upstairs. Everybody was near the door while I ran back to grab them. Then I saw it glimmering out of the corner of my eye. Holographic Charizard. The holy grail of Pokemon cards at the time. I slipped it into my pocket and took it with me. The high didn't last. Right after we got home, the Clermans were already calling, asking if I had seen J. Clerz's card. I caved quickly and had to write a note apologizing to J. Clerz the next day and give him Charizard back. We've been childhood friends, best friends since day one, so we got over it pretty quick, but I'll never forget that feeling of guilt. I'm not exactly sure why that stuck with me, but I feel lucky to have learned that lesson early. Be honest, have integrity, do the right thing. The truth always wins. It's much better to try with good intentions and fail than win by sacrificing your morals. I hope you don't have to learn that the hard way. Elon Musk. Elon Musk is redefining what's possible for a single entrepreneur. Einstein, Jobs, Da Vinci are all artists in their own way. Musk might be the best of the bunch. What he's doing with SpaceX, Tesla, Neuralink, The Boring Company, etc. If he pulls all this off, Elon's companies will bring exceptional value to humanity and change the world, but I don't think they will be his greatest gifts. Inspiration will be, proving that anything is possible. No dream is too big to accomplish. The wave of entrepreneurs he inspires will take us out of this solar system and so far beyond. This might be Elon's greatest gift. If robots and AI don't kill us, we are in for a hell of a ride, and a lot of it thanks to this guy. Filchy. To be filchy is filchy. Tyler, filchy lifestyle follower. If I ever get a tattoo, it will be filchy. Pronounce filchy. It's an expression of positivity, joy, individuality, and creativity. It's a word my squad made up in high school and just owned. Now it's a movement. One of my best friends and the biggest pioneer behind the filchy lifestyle still goes by Jay Filchy to this day. He's a legend, gives no fucks, and is just himself. People like that go zero to one. Why don't more people invent words? All the words we use today were just invented by somebody else. There are so many unwritten rules in society that we, bl that we blindly follow because it's the norm. Tesla is filchy. You are filchy. The world has the potential to be filchy. Woo! All right, that wraps it up. This is Hyperchange, the scheme of consciousness. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the book. I'm gonna put a link in the description if you wanna buy the hard copy on Amazon. Also, if you have made it this far watching the video, thank you so much. I wanna give this copy of the book signed to a Hyperchange Patreon supporter. So the first person that emails me, galileorussell at gmail.com, you will get this book signed, so shoot me an email. Anyway, hope you guys have an awesome day. I'll see you guys next time. Peace.